Hello there, Ben Bowers, the Spirit Specialist, and I am here today to talk to you about a new release from the relatively young Lindor's Abbey Distillery. Uh, this is actually the second new release, and I realised that I hadn't actually done a video for the first. So what we're going to look at is the uh, Lindor's Friar John Cor Cash Strength Congregation Batch Chapter 1 and 2. Um, because I didn't actually do a video for the one. Uh, so these are um, a new selection of cast strength releases that are going to do something slightly differently in terms of the cast makeup of them. Um, if you've seen my previous Lindor's Abbey videos, you'll know that their core bottling um, is a combination of three different cast types, Bourbon, Oloroso and uh, STR red wine casts. But what they're doing with the cast strength, and this was the first time that we'd had a cast strength release available to the general public, um, they are then kind of doing something slightly different in terms of other casks that they're adding in to kind of take the, the core bottling almost into a slightly different direction, but also give you an experience of what it's like at barrel strength. So before I tell you what these two taste like, let me give you some background information about the distillery, about Fry John Core, and also the makeup of these two initial bottlings. Lindor's Abbey is a Tyronesian monastery built in the late 12th century on the edge of Newbur, Fife. It's claimed that the first written reference to whisky being produced in Scotland relates to the Abbey, as the Exchequer Rolls of 1494 list that, by order of King James IV, eight bowls of malt be presented to the monk Friar John Cor to produce aqua vitae. It's thought that Friar Cor resided at Lindor's, and it is more than likely that distilling of some form was taking place well before this date, and as such the Abbey has become known as the spiritual home of Scotch whisky. Now a ruin, the grounds and a neighbouring farm became to be owned by the Mackenzie Smith family, who held the title of Custodians of Lindor's. Drew Mackenzie Smith and his wife Helen had long wanted to build a distillery to honour the historical links to whisky in their grounds, and excavation began in 2013. However, archaeological investigations delayed full construction until 2016, with a visitor centre opening in October 2017 and distillation commencing in December of that year. The water for whisky production is taken from a borehole near the distillery, meaning the water used is from the same source as would have been used at the Abbey. Barley is sourced from the nearby Fife region, and in June 2019, local farms have supplied concerto barley from fields that would have been in Abbey lands. While most new whisky distilleries have produced a gin to provide an ongoing revenue stream while spirit was maturing in cask, Lindor's Abbey instead released an aqua vitae based on recipes found at the Abbey. Whereas originally this would have been essentially new make spirit infused with herbs found in the local area, Lindor's Abbey aqua vitae uses a blend of herbs and spices including Douglas fir and sweet Sicily along with a maceration of dried fruits. The distillery has one wash still and two spirit stills, which are dubbed sister stills. This allows for experimentation with differing cuts to produce a variety of different flavour profiles. Maturation also takes place with a vast array of cask types, with a combination of ex-bourbon casks, STR or shaved, toasted and recharred wine barrels and Oloroso sherry butts being used for their first release. A new chapter in the Lindor's story was opened on the 15th of February 2023 with the first release from the Friar John Core Cash Strength Congregation Batch, an ongoing limited edition series of whiskies bottled at full strength and featuring a marriage of casks that differ somewhat from the core bottling. Chapter 1 utilised a blending of ex-bourbon, STR red wine and Oloroso sherry barrels, along with those that had previously held sweet and floral Mombasiac sherry wines, with a strength of 60.2% ABV. Chapter 2, launched on 12th of July 2023, instead uses ex-bourbon barrels and STR red wine casks, but foregoes the sherry casks to instead use those dubbed rum peat, casks that have initially held heavily peated whiskies from Isla, which were then filled with rum, before being used a third time for Lindor's spirit to draw out both influences. This is the first time an indication of peat in some form has been used in a Lindor's release made available to the public, and it's bottled at 60.9% ABV. Right, so uh, let's look at obviously chapter one first. So this is the uh, Bourbon, Sherry, STR and Mombasiac Sherry casks. Now Mombasiac is quite an interesting one. I'm not going to crack this open, but I am actually keeping these bottles with a view of. Now I don't know, and I've asked uh, Murray, who is the brand ambassador for um, Lindor's, how many of the John Core uh, series is there going to be? Because I'm hoping that there's gonna be six, so that I can keep one aside and we can do a tasting of all six chapters. 
I'm not sure. I did a, a tasting recently with Murray, which was absolutely fantastic. And that was basically their first six releases. So it was the Aquavitae, it was some New Make Spirit, um, it was the standard single malt, and then the three casks of Lindors that make up that standard single malt. What I'm hoping to do, and that was a case of putting them all to one side with a view of doing the tasting, is do exactly the same thing with this, as I have done with Lockley and some of the other um, uh, new distilleries that are coming out, is keep one bottle aside of one, two, let's see how many there are, and then when we get to six, <clears throat> or we could do a tasting with you know, the core bottling and four or five or however many there are. I just, I don't know yet how many chapters there's going to be. Anyway, so the first one is the Mombasiak. And <clears throat> I'm quite intrigued with this because Mombasiak's not, not an obvious sherry cast to kind of like be doing anything with. I'm expecting a little bit more sweetness in. We're bottled at uh, 60.2, whereas the chapter two is 60.9. So let's see what we get with this. Now... <clears throat> When I did that Lindor's tasting with Murray, um, it became clear, even from the new make, there was this lovely sweet fruit character that then ran through all of the bottlings. A little bit like we found with Lockley, when there is that grain character that seems to run through all of the seasonal additions, irrespective of what cask makeup they're using. Very much the same with Lindor's. Lindor's is very, very more fruit forward, um, kind of like orchardy fruits as well. And that really is there on the nose, but you get this lovely underlying kind of sweet honey. It's not quite golden syrup, but it's not quite, you know, like Manuka honey. It's an odd, but in a very good way odd, and it's kind of a very unusual sweetness that's underlying that's slightly floral, slightly honeyed, but not really kind of going too far in any direction, but it really accentuates that fruity note that comes through there. A lovely nose, delicate, um, not intense in any way, but there is a lot going on in here. Mm, and that absolutely comes through. You get much more of a, like a floral honey note, <clears throat> slightly candy floss, candied peel, very much that as well, kind of like candied orange, yeah, candied orange is coming through where you get that kind of like sweet note as well as the orchard fruits. You know, you've got that overriding character of the, the, the single malt, you know. You get a little bit of fruitiness from the STR, you get that vanilla note. The Oloroso Sherry probably is, is the sort of the weakest influence of all the casks that are being used in this. But it definitely gives you a different expression. There is much more of this kind of gentle sort of, you know, it's not, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's honeysuckle, but there is a delicate florality, I don't even know if that's a word, that comes through this. 60.2%, and actually, it's still giving a lot despite that high alcohol content. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to add water to these um, because I can't really be bothered. Um, I, I can't imagine it's going to really kind of open up massively so without because it's still quite delicate it's going to be very easy to over dilute this i really do think that it's not going to take any more than just a couple of drops uh you know i could go and get my pipette and everything like that but i i've got to open the shop in a minute it's before i've opened so i haven't really got time to kind of like let's look at water and everything like that but it is drinking incredibly well at cash strength um, another one I found it again with Lockley and I found this with Wireworks and all these new distilleries are so full of flavor from day one that the amount of cast strength releases or high ABV releases that they're doing that are working really well without dilution. Really interesting this. I think it might be a little bit too, too sweet, a little bit too floral for some people. If you like your big heavy sherry whiskies, this is probably going to be a little bit too delicate. If you like it kind of heavily peated and all that, like if you like big, bold whiskies, this is subtle, gentle, spring, summer, like kind of spring going into summer, you know, everything is blooming already. And there's this kind of like lovely, sweet smell of flowers in the air, but there is a weight to it as well. It's very, very interesting. There is a lot going on. I really, really like this. I have a bit of a sweet tooth anyway, so that you know that might be why it works a little bit better for me. 
Okay, so let's now see how it compares to the chapter two. And in this, we have Bourbon STR. We do not have the Oloroso Sherry in here, but we do have this Rum Peat, um, which is not really a term I've kind of come across before in the industry. And um, this is, and again, thanks to Murray for giving, uh, sending me the uh, sample bottle. So if you do come into the shop and want to try a little bit, I do have a little bit left to do of these two. It, it, I don't know whether this is a term that they've come up with at Lindor's to kind of make it sound a bit more interesting, but from what Murray was telling me was these are um, casks that have been sourced from an Isla distillery. So they've had heavily peated whiskey in that have then had rum in that has then been emptied and then had Lindor spirit put in. So it's kind of like this, you know, it's not a rum cask that's a, a smoky rum, peated rum, anything like that. It's Isla casks that have had rum in then have had the Lindors in. So this is the, according to him, and this is what I've been told, this is the first expression of Lindors available to the general public that has some kind of smoky influence in it. Again, they're not using peat to dry their barley, never have done. So, well, not as far as I know, but this is a way of being able to introduce some smoke. Lockley did the same with their plowing, Filey Bay have done the same with their peated finish, using barrels that have had some kind of smoky whiskey in to introduce a influence of smoke without kind of going through the whole peating, drying process to really kind of hammer it home. And it, it does tend to work with lighter whiskies. It, it, you get this lovely kind of sweet, gentle smoke coming through. So I'd be really intrigued to see how this does. Plus, I'm a big rum fan. It'd be very interesting to see whether the peat or the rum, it, one overpowers the other or one's a bit more dominant or anything like that. Now on the nose, you get sweetness actually quite similar to the uh, the chapter one, but that rummy element's coming through here. We're getting a little bit of that molasses. Not quite kind of Jamaican funk, rum funk or anything like that, but there is a, the sweetness that's on this feels heavier. It feels richer somehow. It feels darker. Not much of a smokiness on the nose, to be honest. Very, very difficult to pick it up. The rum influence is is apparent. Again, you get the vanilla from the bourbon. Little bit of the red berry note, but it's difficult to know whether that's the rum influence or whether that's the STR that's coming through. And obviously no Oloroso Sherry on this at all. I do like this nose though. It feels warmer than the chapter one. It feels, it feels more, it feels like it's got more depth. Hmm. What a fantastic mouthfeel. Feels really thick much thicker than chapter one. Feels almost syrupy. Sweetness coming through. Again, the, what peat, you would not say this is a, you know, a, a peated influence on this. It's sort of there, but it's very, very much in the background. The rum is, is the, the influence here. Vanilla from the bourbon cast again. Again, I'm struggling to differentiate between Rum cask influence and STR influence, but there is a bit very, very fruity. More dark fruit than red fruit. It's got raisins, it's got sultanas. It, it's strange, it's kind of like I would have said that Oloroso casks or sherry casks have been involved, but according to the blurb, apparently not. It's sweet, it's, it's sweeter than the Mombasiak, less floral, more heavy sweet, more kind of like golden syrup, that sort of feel. I'm still really struggling to find this smoky element. And I think what it's doing is it's in the background. I'm not really picking it up on the finish. If there's anything there, it's just kind of like marrying all those flavors within the whiskey together. I'm noticing a spiciness on the palate. That could well be the ABV as well. But the rich texture, again, offsets the ABV. I, I don't think it needs water. Um, I, you know, as with the, the chapter one, it works really, really well. And I think that slightly heavier texture, that slightly syrupy, not syrupy, that's kind of doing it the service. It makes it, that, that makes it sound like it's a liqueur. The, it, I think it's because I've had the chapter one, this feels richer in terms of the mouthfeel, the texture. It feels thicker. It feels like it really coats my mouth. And I think that helps offset the heat from the ABV. Again, really interesting 
kind of taking Lindor's, which is a belter of a whiskey on its own, and just taking it in a slightly different direction. I'm really intrigued. So I was fortunate enough to visit the distillery. This was before the whiskey came out because it was uh, when I was working for Gordon McPhail, we were dealing with, and they just had the Aquavitae and that was it. And I remember going around um, the uh, distillery with the guys I was working with and um, we had a conversation about the cast that they'd got and they said, because they're a new distillery, they were getting phone calls from various sources going, would you like some casks? Do you want to buy some casks? And they were they were pretty much getting all sorts of casks from all over the place that had, had all sorts of different things in, essentially to experiment, to make their core spirit and then kind of put them in a different type of cask to see what it did and see if it evolved in a way that it was like, oh, actually we need to get some more of those. So I think what this is doing is kind of showing the types of casks that they've been playing around with and not maybe going, this is just a Mombasiak cask, but going, okay, this is what it does as an influence to our core flavor profile, which is fruity in itself. Very interesting to try the two side by side. And I hope that there is a few more so that at some point in the near future, I will be able to do a tasting where we can look at all of these and the influence of each individual cask on each one. And obviously, you know, cast strength, you've got all the advantages of that. You've got the disadvantages of having to put water in if you want to and all this lot. But very, very interesting. So I am filming this the day before chapter two comes out. Chapter one, I got a very small allocation. It never even went on the shelf. Um, so I uh, have sent an email out to my mailing list, but I've not allocated it. What I am doing because I have a little bit of stock of other Lindor's bottles still available, is the chapter two is only available as a double pack with either the Aquavitae or the Cask of Lindor's Bourbon Cask 2, the second release of that, there uh, um, goes with that, or the standard single malt, that is it. But what I've done is I've done it as a double pack and you get the equivalent of a fiver off that other bottle. So you do get a little bit of a discount as well as getting the John Cortez 2. You also get a discount off either Aquavitae, the Castle Indoors 2, Bourbon Cask, or the Standard Single Malt. It's all available through the website, www.spiritspecialist.com. Because of the different prices of each of the other bottles, there are three different prices and I can't remember them off the top of my head. So head to the website, search for Lindors, everything's on there if it's still available because if it's anything like the chapter one, it's gonna go like that. It will just absolutely disappear. It is a limited number of bottles. Uh, so, you know, there aren't gonna be many out there and they are gonna get snapped up. Um, it looks good as well. So this bottle harks back to the original 1494 bottle as well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, chapter one and two. And then when three and if others come out after that, I will endeavor to do separate videos for them. Highly recommended, really, really good distillery. I, I really rate Lindor's. I think they're doing a fantastic job. That's me done for this video. I shall see you at the next one. Cheers.